enemies with it. All right. And off we go. I always really love this music at the beginning. It's just such, like... I don't know. I think this game is built almost entirely on all of the little tiny details that they, they put into it, you know? All of the small appreciation things. Um, like the fact that you could move the urchins with the shield on the beach. Um... The fact this little part has, like, its own little music track that you never hear again. Um, I'll try and think of some more. There's more. <clears throat> Hoot Hoot. So you're the lad who owns the sword. Now I understand why the monsters are starting to act so violently. A courageous lad has come to wake the windfish. It is said that you cannot leave the island. Unless you wake the windfish. You should now go north to the mysterious forest. I'll wait for you there. Hoot. You found your sword. It must be yours because it has your name engraved on it. Alright. Um... So I had uh, that big long tirade uh, when I was playing Fusion, uh, and it actually generated some uh, discussion, which was amazing. I didn't actually expect it to do uh, anything, let alone, uh, you know, have some nice commentary. Um, and it, I guess it's emboldening me to kind of like, I genuinely think now, looking back, oh fuck an acorn. You got a guardian acorn. It will reduce the damage you take by half. Um, I hate this music. <laughs> okay, it's gone now. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how we, as like, as video gamers, as like communities, as like, you know, all the fucking, fucking buzzwords and shit. Like, it's just how we grew up with video games and media and how we consumed it all. Um, and I've, I generally feel like we took a lot, a lot of the wrong ideas away, you know. Um, when I was talking about fusion. Um, I think I even mentioned this game. There's, like, I've found pixel artists who have, like, redone this exact screen right here, you know, but, um, the thing I was really being specific about is that because, um, Fox over there has, is a sprite, and he's bouncing around, and because the house and the sidewalk, they're all, like, these pieces that have been assembled into a game cartridge and then reassembled in a specific format or a specific order, um, there's constrictions to everything that's going on here. You know, there's uh, there's there's limitations. And when you're a pixel artist, you don't you're not really working on those. You're just kind of working off of nostalgia and what you want to throw in, and you kind of lose that. You know, you lose the fact. Like if we look. Uh, right where the fox just was. You see how the grass, the square of the grass, is, like, it's not, like, fading. It's not blended in at all with the tree. It's, like, a you can see the line, you know? Like, most pixel artists will completely ignore that and blend it into the bush. Um, when, really, I think you're kind of losing a few things of that sort. Um... Uh... I don't want to paste that one if I know. Um, so that was one of the things, I, and that, I think that generally went over, you know, decently. Um, You got a piece of heart. Select, press select on the subscreen to see. 
Uh, I forgot to read the shell one. Oh well. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to how to address this. Hoot! Oh, brave lad, on your quest to wake the dreamer. Welcome to the mysterious wood. Much of the mystery you'll find on this uncharted continent island. I'm afraid you may find it a trifle difficult to leave the island while the windfish naps. By the by, have you ever visited the Tail Cave, which is south of the village? Go there with the key you find in this forest. The windfish is watching. So this, uh, I want to kind of hit two things. Um, so the first one is... Uh, I mentioned it took me four years to beat this game. Is I ha you might think, like, well, how the fuck... How do you do that? Um, number one, I'm stupid. Uh, that's pretty... Uh, there's no arguing with that. <laughs> and number two, you know, like, kids... I think I've mentioned this before. Kids, they don't have a lot. They don't have eight fucking hours to sit on a game. You know, like, sometimes they may have two, and then you have to go do homework or... Um, eat dinner and take a shower and, you know, you've got, you've got shit going on. Uh, or you may have after-school activities, or you may be at a friend's house, you know, or you may have to go to your dad's house for the weekend and you can't take the Game Boy with you. You gotta leave it home. You know, that kind of shit. And, um... I think there's also a big part of it. Number one, um reading levels and it was a thing when i was a kid that you know i was still learning to read better like i was always a pretty avid reader i think as a kid i, I maybe it wasn't I can't, I, re I can't remember really struggling with reading but um i know for a fact i didn't know every single word in pokemon red and i didn't know every single word here so uh, a lot of the text, like the owl telling me exactly where the tail cave was, I either didn't remember or I didn't really understand yet. Um, and so I probably just kind of glossed over it and didn't remember where the tail cave was, so I got stuck in it. I was stuck in the mysterious woods for weeks, if not months. Um... And I specifically remember, not only, and I'll show you the monkey I used to farm, uh, I had the shovel, I had bombs, I had the bow, and I bought the bow, I didn't steal the bow, I bought the damn bow, so I had a thousand fucking, uh, uh, over a thousand rupees, um, before I even got into the tail cave, and not only that, there is one specific glitch where if you go through enough doorways in one instance, you'll actually get a different uh, color tunic randomly. Um, and uh, it hit in the cave here in the mysterious woods. Um, and I couldn't figure out for life me why I had that, you know? Um... But, uh, yeah, kids will get stuck in places, or they'll just, like, you have to understand, um, the, the, the mindset of children. It's like, you, you give them a game, they don't understand what a video game really is yet, so they don't understand the constraints, like, the, the, the handrails of Zelda, you know, like, we know there is a set path, there is a cookie-cutter path that you have to go here, then to the dungeon, then to the next spot, then to another dungeon, back and forth, eight times, right? We got that, we get it, you know? Um, and we know that there's no, there's no, like, you, there's no side things, there's no, like, you can't walk onto, like, these brown areas where the trees are, you know? So... We know that, like, experimentation really doesn't have a whole lot of place, you know, um, as adults. As children, you don't really get that yet, so you're just trying everything, you know? 
I remember tapping every single wall with my sword because I thought maybe there is a bomb place or a place I can blow up. I did the same with these walls in here. You know, like I just tested things. I sat around with that, uh, the, I guess they're green slimes now, but I always kind of consider them like some kind of like hooded figures. And if you put the magic powder on them, he starts talking in Jamaican accent. Like I used to sit around with that guy and try and just figure out what the hell he was saying. Um, so just so you know, raccoons have a very sensitive, uh, to stuff like dust and powder. So <laughs> this guy, um, I got stuck with him for a long time because I didn't get what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, you're going to be lost. Thanks to me. Um... And I didn't know that I had to go back, or I didn't know where I needed to take the mushroom. You know, it was like, a lot of the problem solving as a kid, you just don't have the, the mental facilities yet, you know. Um, so I got stuck here, and then I immediately got stuck before Bottle Grotto, or I got stuck in Bottle Grotto for a long time, too. Because um, of that one specific room where you have to kill the enemies in order, and you don't actually know their names. Um... It's like, so, you just have to keep trying, and again, if you only have an hour to get to that spot in the dungeon, and you don't figure it out, you're gonna have to come back the next day and do it again, and over and over and over, you know, it's like, um, there are, there are constraints that kind of, kind of mold your, uh, your adventure, and... Those are the points that I think really stick with us and become formative. You know, like, um, I'm gonna try and stop saying, you know, I keep saying, you know, you picked the toadstool. As you hold it over your head, a mellow aroma flows into your nostrils. I, I would do this shit. I would, like, hold up the mushroom. It's a toadstool you picked in the woods. What is it for? You hold it over your head, a mellow aroma wafts, like, there was a, there's a measure of, like, adventure point-and-click logic to this game, where you have to just try things on things, you know? Like, that's the only way, unless you knew, to try the, um... Uh, try the powder on the raccoon, finally, like, you just kind of get fed up and use everything you have, and... You know, my ass, I had a bomb, and I had a bow and arrow... And a shovel, so obviously I had to stop and try those. Um, quick aside, I actually had a dream. I remember I had a dream. I think I was still a kid. I remember. Um, of Legend of Link's Awakening, it was a specific item. Like, it was a weapon. A crystal ball. And the crystal ball would make a staircase right here. So you could clip onto these, um, these raised floors up here, right? Or what appears to us to be a race floor. Really, it's just like... There's nothing there in the game. You know, the game, it's just those walls and that's it. But they couldn't really just block it out. So they put uh, what looks like another floor up there. So, in my dream, you could walk around on the f top of the cave up there. Um, but occasionally, you would lo like you just take damage randomly. Uh, really weird stuff. Um... But anyway, so it's those points where we as kids got stuck and we were just trying, like, keep trying everything, keep running around, stuck in the same areas um, that one would stick with us longer, you know? Um, so when you think back to, like, say, Link's Awakening or Pokemon Red, like, a lot of people talk about Brock, not because he was actually challenging. But because that was the area you're probably stuck in the longest in Pokemon Red. You know, after that point, the game breezed pretty fast. Or maybe someone was stuck with Misty. Especially if you only had Charmeleon. You know, or something like that. And so you were just running back and forth between routes 24 and 25 trying to find a way to beat Misty. You know, and, and that kind of shit. Um, so, where I'm getting, where I'm going with all this is... Uh, talking about procedural generation. 
and like procedural generation kind of came up as a concept because we saw um uh the fellow i was discussing with was talking about the linearity of fusion and how that ended up being a good thing because it allowed them to script out hard challenging areas and intense areas you know and i agreed with them i uh talked about that place in uh in the whole power outage uh, section where you have to run from the SAX, you can't get away, but you've also never been there, so you have no idea what's in front of you, and it's a bunch of fucking gates that you have to aim diagonally while running and avoiding her. Um, it's super stressful and super horrifying, you know? It's, it's good spooky shit. Um, so in those cases, linearity and... Uh, yeah, I, I guess, like, method, methodological creation of levels, you know, allowed for uh, an artistic direction. Um, whereas procedural generation, you're throwing that into an algorithm. You're letting, uh, you're letting the computer randomly create these things based on parameters. And then you're hoping that the player will be the one to fill in the stress, the horror. They'll find those things in there, you know? You don't know if it's ever going to be there. Um, but I think the lesson that we took from all of this, what we were looking for in procedural generation, wasn't... Uh, we weren't looking for the new experience, because that's really what like it was first built for, you know? It's like, you can play a new game every time you fire it up but there's always something missing because even when you play a brand new version like a new minecraft world or a new uh a new level of slay or a new round of slay the spire you know any of those even when everything's fresh you have a new experience and you even you can tailor your experience to remove the things that you've done before there's still an obvious formula to them, right? You begin to kind of feel that familiarity. There is, even when you don't want it to be there, even when you want the shock of new things or of being stumped or like being put in a frustrating or infuriating situation, you still, you see the lines, the seam on production, right? Because it's procedural. Because so much of that game... Oh, you know what? Excuse me a second. Excuse me. Uh, it's not 100%. Um, because so much of that game is put into the process of creation. Of making procedurally creating things, uh, you're losing out on a lot of areas that you could have better used that space or that of those resources to handcraft uh, a more thematic or a more uh, memorable experience, you know? Um, like Warframe, I'll, that's another good one. Um, the first couple spy missions on the Grenier Galleon you're terrified, you know? The place is spooky. It's all orange and full of military-grade equipment. And, you know, it looks like a Star Trek episode. And all this, like... Like, you're sneaking through ducks and spy, and you're, like, there's a floating thing. You have no idea what it does. Like, you're just... You're terrified of it all. And then, like, even though you're not going to do that level again, and even if you do do it, the tile map has changed, and the level of the enemies may be a different level, and even a different... Uh, kind, but by the time you've done like your 600 spy mission, you're not even thinking, you know, you're not looking at the level, you're not thinking about the enemies, you're just doing your fucking muscle memory hardcore parkour to get right into the spies, uh, the, the actual, um, uh, vault to knock it out as fast as possible so you can go back and do it again. You're losing a lot of that initial experience. You're losing the uh, 
the things that made those experiences memorable with procedural generation. Even when something's experienced for the first time, it's still too formulaic. And so I think we've taken the we've taken the wrong lesson away from there. Where before we were having informative experiences by being stuck, by being frustrated, by not knowing where to go, and just dicking around. Um, we've instead mistaken uh, that for, oh, we need a new experience. You know, and we just assume that we're going to get stumped. We assume that it's going to feel like we're eight again playing this new round of whatever procedurally generated game you're doing, you know? When in reality, it's not. Um, Because you are an adult, because you have an adult brain with proper problem-solving skills and critical thinking skills, you're not going to sit here thinking, oh, if I use the mushroom on this one particular tree on the map, it's going to disappear and there's going to be a cave, you know, or something silly. It's like, you're not going to you're not going to think that. You know exactly what the parameters are because you know what a video game is by now. Um, so I guess, like, I don't know what you what we're looking for instead. Uh, I had an idea that I've kind of lost it at this point. Um, but procedural generation, I think, was another one of those mistakes. You know? I think right, it was, and it sounds like it's it's a harsh it's a harsh way to say it, but you know I think it was uh, not what we should have been focusing on. You know, not the new experience, but that experience of being wholly and totally unsure in everything, in the the rules of the game, in the laws of the game. You know that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I th- we'll just leave that for right now and kind of continue on because I'm just wasting time. So I mentioned earlier um, that a lot of people probably took this game, like me, as like an inspiration for their thinking and game design in the future. Uh, a lot of times that amounts to them just making a Zelda game. Um... But I really like kind of the smaller, subtle details of games like this. I missed the slime. There it is. Okay. Um, like, if I had to make a dungeon um, in a Zelda game. I would make it so that you would have to come back to that dungeon four or five times. You know? Like, there'd be... If you're doing... um, Yeah. Uh, If you're doing... Progress gating through... uh, (laughs) I love that room. Uh, Through items or equipment. Um... You know, have some places that you can't access uh, until you have items in the future. You know, then you have to come back for them. Hmm, Teen Strobe, that's interesting. And there's another part of this game, like, um, this game can be spooky, but it's not a direct form of spooky. It's more of like an existential spooky. Um, it's not in your face in any way, shape, or form. Um, like, even though it's a fucking nightmare, it's really not a terrifying looking nightmare because it's, it's, it's a fucking shadow blob, you know? Um... You know, the, the horror more or less exists in the fate of Connellit after you finish, you know, what becomes of all the people there. 
or in the fact that the, the shopkeeper uh, that you rob uh, ends up being like uh, having a one hit KO inexplicably or you know that, that kind of shit like um, damn it I wanted to hit him You know, just various things of that nature, I think. Go down now. Time for my favorite mini bosses. These guys. I want to talk about spooky. These guys are pretty fucking spooky. I mean, they don't really do anything, they're not hard. Especially to get him in the corner like this, Jesus. But the, the spooky part is more of like, they're just these giant faceless metal mouths. Just kind of scooting around, you know? Like, the horror there is more of what you make of it. Whereas, like, you know, something from Undertale. You know, you think of Flowery, the final boss. It's like. You know, that's kind of in your face about all the shit going on at that point. Um, oh yeah. This is one of the only few dungeons where you actually get to make use of... Um, the warp point here. There was a... a uh, oh wait, no, you can't because I don't have the fucking Pegasus boots yet. Um, Jesus Christ, where's my fucking brain today? Alright, now I need to figure out where I'm supposed to go, so. Oh, I, get it. Oh, I didn't go up, did I? Fuck. No way I did. Yeah, it's just that room. Okay. I can't go over because that requires Pegasus boots. Did I fuck up? Is it just like right here? Yeah, it is. I'm an idiot. God damn it. For some reason, I got the rooms mixed up and I thought all those fucking bomb rooms that we just went through, uh,. Connected to the mini boss room. Yeah, I'm I'm dumb. Fuck me. There we go. Now we got the fuck Pegasus boots. Um. Like, if you want to get, if you want your game to be, and like, even the fucking the whole idea of a game has to be spooky now. It's kind of like old hat. It's like, it's been done to death, and this game is kind of guilty of even making that a concept. Uh, the same with the whole everything's a dream kind of fucking thing. Like, this is one of the first games that people remember that being a big core tenant of. Next up here. There we go. Gotta get a good fucking roll in. Okay, now we can go back. It's really like, I just feel like 
we've lost any nuance of subtlety, you know? That's just not a priority anymore for anyone. Um... Because again, we've just kind of missed the point on a lot of things. And we think the experience. Oh my god, 200. Um, this game probably taught me a static, too, honestly. Um, we think that our initial experiences were formed the first time we went through an area when in reality it was more like the 20th time because we got stuck there, you know? Um, there we go. Um, we look at pixel art and we attribute uh, a lot of details when usually a lot of those things were skimped on to conserve space, you know? Or uh, we attribute a lot of spooky ideas to things that just weren't really spooky. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, It, it may just be that we don't really have a culture of, like, genuine reflection, I guess. You know, like, people hop on a trend. You know, like, retro games are currently a trend. Uh, one day they will not be. I look forward to that day, and I don't have to pay 60 fucking dollars just to have a game that I used to play as a kid, you know? Go down and come back, I think. Another thing I was thinking about today, because I was just thinking lots today. That's all I do is think. Um, I was thinking about Marin. And how much I appreciate that you actually get to go on a little fucking mini date with her in this. And like, it's not just like dumb shit, you know? You're not just uh, trying to get a job done. You know, you're actually spending some time with her and, you know, having good conversations and shit. It's like, it's nice. It's, again, something I wish, I wish there was more. I feel like this is a wall here. No. It's like, uh, it's like how people remember the first three or four hours of Kingdom Hearts 2 more than the last, like, 80. Um, what a weird object. It's not because, you know, the first part of the game was, like, better. It's because you had... It was more memorable because you had... Like, you were just piddling around, you know? You are having fun, uh, fun adventures. Tarn, you can wait for a second. I'll go in here. Oh, it's just this. Okay. I always thought she was a bird. <laughs> I still don't really see a fairy. Oh, Fane, have you got a nice stick? Can I borrow it for a second? Why is the music doing that? I got a football helmet. Look, can be a look. Not sure how it happened, but take it. Yeah. Yeah, fuck him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, games need a certain degree of, like, fuck aroundery, you know? Like, just, um, the beginning of Chrono Trigger, you know? You're not worried about saving the world. You're, you're fucking hanging out with this cool chick at the, the fucking fair, you know? That kind of shit. 
Uh, I'm going the wrong way, I think. I'm going to get tired, I am.